received notice from the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs that he wishes to make another statement. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish to make a statement in compliance with Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act regarding the 13th meeting of the North South Ministerial Council in the Aquaculture and Marine Sector, which was held on Wednesday, 21 October. Due to the current COVID restrictions, this meeting was conducted via video conference. The Executive was represented by Minister Nicola Mallon, as accompanying Minister and I. The Irish Government was represented by Mr Eamon Ryan, TD, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, who chaired the meeting. The statement has been agreed with Minister Mallon, and I am making it on behalf of both of us. Ministers welcome the report on the activities of the Locks Agency, including the ongoing conservation and protection efforts, and noticed in particular the Locks Agency's response to COVID-19. The Locks Agency's strategic direction for a new decade, 2020-2030, the collaborative work and delivery of a number of conservation, angling and marine tourism projects, and the success of Foyle and Carlingford Ambassador Programme. The Council also welcomed the Locks Agency continued investment in a scientific fisheries monitoring programme. The Council agreed that the Locks Agency, the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications will continue to work together to consider the impact of the UK withdrawal from the EU. Ministers agreed this matter <coughs> will be kept under review at future NSMC meetings in the sector. The Council approved the Locks Agency business plans and budget grants for 2017-18. Uh, 2018-19 and 2020, and the Locks Agency corporate plans 2017 to 2019 and 2020 to 2022, which have been completed in accordance with agreed guidance issued by the Department of Finance and Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, and which have been agreed by sponsor departments and finance ministers. These plans could not be formally approved in the absence, uh, previously in the absence of the NSMC. The Council noted the Locks Agency's annual reports and accounts. Uh, for the 20 years 2016, 2017 and 2018, which have been led before the Northern Ireland Assembly and both Houses of the Oireachtas. The Council uh, approved the continuation for a period of one year with effect from 21 October 2020 of the framework designed to support the Locks Agency in dealing with emergencies such as a serious pollution incident. Ministers agreed to review the operation of this procedure, including as possible in Yale, based on a report from the Locks Agency and the sponsor departments before the 20th of October 2021. The Council noted the Locks Agency, with the support of the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications, is undertaking a competitive recruitment process for the post of Chief Executive of the Agency. In this regard, the Council noted that the sponsor departments are shortly to seek approval from their finance departments for the recruitment process and the terms and conditions of the post. The Council also noted that the recruitment process will be managed uh, by the Southern Public Appointment Service, as agreed with the sponsor departments. Finally, the Council agreed to hold its next aquaculture and marine meeting in 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call the chairperson of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, Declan McAleer, to ask the question. Uh, I thank the Minister for his, his statement. Uh, the min Minister made reference to uh, Loch Foyle in the statement and indeed uh, many re references to the Loch Agency. The Minister will also be aware that the ongoing dispute over the ownership of Loch Foyle is uh, impeding the full remit of the Loch Agency's work. Does he have any update on how best to deal with this particular dispute? Thank you. Well, in terms of Loch Foyle, there's <coughs> issues arising. Um, in Loch Foyle, which um, causes problems. So the long-running jurisdictional issue in Loch Foyle is a reserved matter, and it's not within the competence of my department or indeed the Assembly, and can only be resolved by the agreement of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in London and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the Republic of Ireland. And the lack of resolution of the jurisdictional issue has, however, created practical difficulties, as the member indicates. In creating a system for licensing of aquaculture in Loch Foyle, and consequently, there is a significant unregulated aquaculture activity. So, currently, the Locks Agency has no authority to intervene in this expansion. I have raised my concerns about the unregulated activity with the Northern Ireland Secretary of State and asked for an update on progress made by both governments to resolve the current difficulties. The Minister of State for Northern Ireland has advised me that the UK Government recognises the need to take action to address this illegal activity and that it remains committed to working closely with the Irish Government over improvements to the management of the locks. The UK Government is optimistic that progress can be made by both governments 
on a management agreement in Lockville, which would enable authorities to exercise criminal and regula regulatory jurisdiction of the bed of the lock. So I very much support the efforts of both governments to progress an agreement which will enable a licensing regime within Loch Foyle until such times as the jurisdictional issue will be resolved. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And this question is probably in relation to the past one too. Is what steps are being taken to ensure illegal oyster treaties are stopped in Loch Foyle, given the impact this unregulated practice will have on the environment? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the Locks Agency estimates that there are some 70,000 oyster trestles, um, which are particularly on the Donegal side of the loch. This unregulated oyster farming is in inextricably linked uh, to the jurisdictional issue, which we've just dealt with, a reserved matter, uh, which is not within our competence. Um, the unregulated activity, however, creates a number of hazards and risks, including the potential threat to the introduction of non-native species and a threat to the environment generally. Currently, the Locks Agency has not got the authority to intervene um, our own, uh, in our own jurisdiction. Um, a lot of the, the trestles have been set up on land which was owned by the Crown Estate, and we were able to have a large proportion of those trestles removed. Unfortunately, the individuals um, have moved to the Donegal side and set up the trestles, and uh, there is a, a considerable issue um, at that uh, side of the loch on this. Uh, there is a clear understanding that the area within Northern Ireland um, that, those, that, that, that we have been able to take um, some degree of enforcement action, and the robust approach prevented the spread of illegal aquaculture development on the Northern Ireland side, and we would uh, encourage very strongly um, that the authorities in the Republic of Ireland um, would find a means of taking actions against those individuals who are setting up the illegal trestles. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement uh, before us today, and it's very welcome. Um, in towns like Dundrum the South, in South Down, we see native crayfish stocks, which are among the finest in Ireland but now they are becoming depleted. Could I ask the Minister how the North South Council intends to re-establish a cross-border technical aquaculture advisory service for the whole of the North and not just the cross-border locks? Well, um, the issue that, that the member raises is, is, an issue, is an issue which is directly for her sales um, within NIEA, and therefore it's a matter that we would be happy to, to deal with. Um, if the member wants to write to me, um, we, will, we will certainly correspond with them on how best we can conserve um, the, 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 the various species which, which are in Dundrum Bay, uh, which is a very important um, and a very uh, sensitive environmental area indeed. Thank you. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Thank you. Minister, how big a problem is there with the illegal fishing, such as poaching, for the Locks Agency, particularly in the foil area? And how, how many people have been prosecuted for the illegal fishing in this area? Well, salmon poaching is one of the big, big issues. And illegal fishing activity and, and water pollution um, remains of concern. And the Locks Agency has seized a significant quantity of illegal fishing material. Seizures by Locks Agency staff show a fall compared to 2019 figures. Um, so in 2019, there were 303 seizures of items such as boats, nets, rods, and fish, uh, compared with 165 seizures to date in 2020. Um, so the breakdown is as follows um, boats and cars. Um, seizures in 2019 2 and 2027, nets in 2019 31, uh, 2020 30, other um, 8 in 2019 4 and, and 2020, rods 47 in 2019, um, 54 in 2020, fish 215 in 2019, and 70 in 2020. Uh, so that gives us a total of 300 seizures in 2019 165 thus far uh, in 2020 to the 16th of October. The agency has instigated a significant number of prosecution cases stemming from these enforcement actions. 
The agency has also collaborated with the Police Service of Northern Ireland and on Garda Shikona and other enforcement agencies uh, to secure convictions. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Can I thank the, the Minister for the statement? Uh, we are, Deputy Speaker, more than ever in a time when we need workable solutions to complex jurisdictional issues. I, I note there are frameworks in place to deal with emergencies. We have been reminded in recent days of the importance of that. But c- can I, on a different theme, ask if there is also a refreshed or renewed effort to help promote the uh, tourism product on this island, which might, for example, examine interchangeable or transferable angling licences to assist in the post-COVID recovery? Well, I think uh, we all recognise that angling has traditionally been something which has been a huge tourist draw um, to this jurisdiction, and that's something which uh, we warmly welcome. Uh, so our cooperation uh, with tourist authorities um, and the promotion of that uh, is something which we will continue to engage in. Um, our cooperation with others in terms of um, licensing is, is something that we are happy to engage in uh, to ensure that visitors who, who come um, to Ireland, be it Ireland uh, north or, 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 or south, um, that they would have as good an opportunity as possible uh, to uh, enjoy uh, the angling that is available um, and make it as, um, let's put it, uh, 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 as little bureaucracy as possible for the individuals that are doing it. That, that just makes sense. Nicole William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, in paragraph four, the Council agreed that the Lox Agency, the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications will continue to consider the impact of the UK withdrawal from the EU. Can I ask the Minister, has the agriculture se- uh, and marine sector any particular concerns in relation to leaving the EU? Um, a- aquaculture less so um, than perhaps uh, the sea fishing sector, uh, but m- most of that material um, won't have issues around the import of goods from GB, and consequently, uh, whatever opportunities there is of selling their product, um, they will be able to sell it both in, in, in GB um, and indeed the single market. So those issues would be of less concern in terms of the aquaculture section. Um, than they would be uh, in, for example, the deep sea fishing, uh, where there are still issues outstanding, where uh, fish caught perhaps in, in UK waters, um, outside of the, the Northern Ireland zone, um, would then be regarded as imports to the European Union single market and consequently have to go through um, a whole series of hoops as a consequence of that. Um, so those issues are still to be resolved in the negotiations that are being carried out. Uh, so one hopes that, that we will get a resolution to that uh, to everyone's satisfaction. I call Philip McGuigan. Gary Melgut, uh, last time caller. Can I ask the Minister uh, for an update on the readiness of the North's ports uh, for the end of the Brexit transition period and uh, what will happen uh, should they not be fully ready come that date? I'm not sure how it's related to this, but temporary facilities will be um, available from the 15th of December and be in place. Um, so that's, that's um, the actions that have been taken. Uh, the more permanent facilities won't be available probably until the middle part of next year. Um, but uh, the, the procurement procedures um, have, have been started. Um, the companies have been awarded uh, the contracts and uh, floods are, are now available for three of the four sites, uh, so work will probably be commencing on those in the not too distant future. Um, but there will be temporary measures put in place to ensure that food enters Northern Ireland, irrespective of, of, of the protocol. I call Sinead Ennis. I get, uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his statement. And can I ask the Minister what assurances can he give that Locke's uh, agency will continue to see, receive EU funding post-Brexit? Well, uh, Locke's agency will continue to apply for, for funding from uh, whatever sources, uh, and in terms of that, uh, the key sources will be um, ourselves and indeed uh, the Irish Government. In terms of particular projects, um, there will be opportunities um, to apply for EU funding, and uh, it is likely that, that we will continue 
uh, to do that uh, in terms of the funding that is drawn down. The Lox Agency has been involved in a series of projects. Uh, so, for example, Interreg 5A, there was a sea monitor project um, which delivered €4.6 million. Euros, and that is into, uh, a unique marine research project studying the seas around the island of Ireland and Western Scotland, using innovative tracking technology to better understand and protect vulnerable marine life. It also is a project partner in other EU projects called SWELL, which uh, is a €35 million Euro project, and Catchment Care, which is a €13.7 million project. The agency is projected uh, to bring in uh, around £700,000 in interreg funding in 2020, out of its total budget of £5.475 million. And we have been reassured by the, uh, by the assurance from the two governments and the European Union uh, to continued funding of Interreg 5A, allowing the projects to con- reach their conclusion in 2023, and the development of a new Peace Plus programme from 2021 to 2027. And these will focus on a range of nature-based solutions and other initiatives of support environmental protection, sustainable economic activity and climate action. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his answers. Um, in relation to the expansions at the, the points of entry, Minister, um, can you advise, has there been any consultation with the LOCKS Agency around any potential for impact, be it environmental or other? I'm not sure if there has. There may well have been. Um, <clears throat> there shouldn't be a, an impact because uh, the goods that are being brought in um, will be goods that have been brought in for, for many years. Uh, the impact is on uh, the end user, the consumer, uh, with potential additional cost. And uh, that is something that we need to remove. And it is something that the European Union needs to take account of. So. Uh, insisting on export health certificates, for example, for food, which is going to end up on shelves in shops in Northern Ireland. Um, those goods will do no violence whatsoever to the single market. So why, why, why does the European Union want to produce additional costs and additional bureaucracy and onerous burden on those businesses, which will inevitably be passed to consumers uh, in Northern Ireland, some of the, the, the consumers with the lowest disposable income um, in the UK um, as a consequence. So it is important that we all continue to drive the message home um, to the European Union that in these negotiations they need not to introduce things which will going to create additional burdens uh, to consumers and businesses in Northern Ireland, particularly those things which will have no impact, zero impact on uh, the credibility of the single market. Call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his statement. With, with regard to paragraphs 7 and 8, and the decision to extend the Lock Agency's uh, framework for emergencies by one year only uh, to allow for a review, uh, does the review suggest that there are concerns that the current framework is not fit for purpose? Um, thank the member for the question. I would suggest that rather than saying that it's not fit for purpose, is that we always need to be continually um, reviewing how uh, we engage in things and where we can improve on, on the, the good practice that currently exists. Then we should carry out such improvements. So, you know, the agency has responded very quickly, for example. Um, to the issue around more beg, which is, which is critically important that they do. And uh, we need to get um, as good an outcome as possible in the circumstances where we have this uh, major pollution incident um, in that area. And I'd have to say that the agency would uh, appear thus far to have responded very well. Uh, but that in terms of all of these things, it's always good to review what you have been doing, the practice that you've been involved in, and if you can improve it, um, certainly we all, always uh, need to look at how we can improve. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement and his answers so far. Could I ask the Minister, has there been any lock agency response to salmon farming? Have any discussions taken place to investigate possible pollution and disease through this activity and the impact it may have 
on wild salmon during their migration to Northern Ireland rivers? Salmon farming is um, certainly an issue of concern for, <coughs> for many jurisdictions. It is something which is um, not as significant activity here as it would be in some other jurisdictions. Um, so consequently, uh, those concerns um, wouldn't have uh, come to the fore to the same extent. Uh, but certainly, salmon itself, the wild salmon, is a wonderful resource to have. Um, it is a resource that has been diminishing uh, in Northern Ireland um, o o over a period of time. Uh, we have never quite got to the bottom of the reason for it. Uh, so some of our high-quality salmon rivers don't have as many salmon as, as they would previously have had. Um, and therefore, it is important that we continue to identify how best we can ensure that that salmon stock uh, is maintained um, and you know, ultimately we turn the tide and, and it increases in years to come. Salmon is something which draws um, tourists from far and wide uh, where you have quality salmon fishing and therefore our focus needs to be on that particular um, source uh, as opposed to um, salmon farms which have a much more limited uh, um, financial um, return and environmentally um, are much more challenging. Uh, for, for us. I call Liz Kimmins. Good morning, good pre-class. Can call and I thank the minister for his statement. Can I ask what work is being done to ensure that fishermen from north and south will have access to all the island's waters post-Brexit? Well, clearly that's a matter for <coughs> both jurisdictions in terms of its fishing rights and, and um, licensing. Um, currently. The licences are, are very cheap here in Northern Ireland, I think around £20. Pounds. Um, so people who want to engage in fishing um, can engage in that sport for a relatively mod modest cost. And uh, that's something which we want to encourage people to get out into the countryside. Uh, it is an activity where most of the fish are actually returned to the waters once again uh, by, by most of our anglers. And uh, they do it just for... Um, the, the enjoyment of getting out um, into a, a river area, out into the open air, and engaging in that activity that they enjoy. I call Cahill Boylan. Good morning, Mr. Boylan. Could I welcome the Minister's statement? Just, Minister, in, in uh, paragraph 3, it mentions the uh, lock agency's response to COVID 19. Can you detail the nature of that response and its impact? Yeah, the agency has engaged in ongoing efforts, particularly um, with regard to providing a safe environment for its employees, but also stakeholders and members of the public, <coughs> while continuing to deliver um, a valuable public service in difficult times. Fishery protection staff, who play an important role in protecting our shared natural resources, returned to full operational duties um, since the 18th of May, and a full range of statutory scientific surveys have recommenced. The Lock Agency's goal is to offer a hybrid model of working which facilitates a blend of home and office working with ongoing monitoring and adherence to public health guidance. Riverwatch Visitor Centre remains closed. The delivery of capital projects has recommenced where possible, with all projects being kept under constant review. I call Matthew Toll. Thank you. Uh Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, first of all, whether the um, Locks, agency has uh, Locks Agency has had a, an increase in funding to deal with the consequences of Brexit, and if so, can he give us the quantum? Secondly, could I ask him if conversations were had around the fate of our, our eel fisheries, particularly in Loch Ney, who obviously would see their main market decimated if there was not a comprehensive deal with the EU? Were Loch Ney eel fisheries mentioned, and uh, what are the latest conversations he's had with that sector? Lock the eel fishery wasn't mentioned in this context because um, obviously it isn't um, part of the, the, the agency's remit. Um, that is uh, with, solely within this jurisdiction, and it, it rests with all of the other arguments that I have been placing um, with the European Union, with the UK government negotiators, uh, for the well-being um, of uh, our, our, our people who, who um, are selling product. Uh, both the GB and the European Union. Um, I don't believe that there has been additional funding awarded to the Locks Agency 
uh, for Brexit issues. Nicole Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I want to focus again on issues of transboundary environmental breaches of existing environmental laws, and to be specific with regard to the aquaculture and marine breaches. I mean, we know, for example, in the Northern Ireland stats that 78% uh, of our shellfish water bodies now fail water quality standards for E. coli, for example, and also that there has been a fall, a decline a question, in freshwater birds by up to 42%. Minister, are these statistics collated island-wide so as we can know the full extent across this island to come up with strategies to deal with that transboundary going into the future? I yeah, thank the member for the question. At the meeting, um, the agency reported on the number of pollution incidents over the past five years. There has been a total of 210 incidents dealt with in 2020 to date. Uh, compared with a total of 252 in 2019, so that gives uh, the member uh, a feel for, for the number of incidents. Um, I'm concerned about the number of serious pollution incidents in our rivers. I believe that the Locks Agency has a responsibility to work closely um, with the, the, the local community, both here and in the Republic of Ireland, to reduce pollution and the inevitable fish kills in the Foyle and Carlingford catchment areas. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Minister, correct me if I am wrong, but is it the case that the Vox Agency has been without a chair for over two and a half years, without a chief executive for over three and a half years, yet I see no reference to any of that in the statement? And more than that, is there a problem in the agency with absentee board members? I refer to the fact that the minutes of the Vox Agency suggest that Mr Ian McRae, formerly of this parish, who receives something like £6,000 a year to be a member of the Lock Agency, has not bothered to attend a single board meeting since October 2018. What action has been taken to deal with absentee board members? Well, I, I thank the member for the question. And <coughs> maybe he was not listening whenever uh, the statement was being made. It is not like him. Uh, but the Council noted that uh, we are, um, sponsor departments are to seek approval from the finance departments for the recruitment process in terms and conditions of the post of chief executive of the agency, and that a um, recruitment process is being taken uh, for a chief executive. Um, clearly, there have been issues uh, with the fact that uh, there was no NSMC cover. Uh, for uh, the appointment of either chair or chief executive, uh, but that has been brought underway uh, immediately. And that concludes questions to the minister on the statement. Could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments?